for joining us. John and I are excited to have you here today. Uh, my name is Kelly Hopping, and I am the Chief Marketing Officer over at Demandbase. Um, I have only been there a couple months, uh, but I am loving it. Um, I'm loving the opportunity to help uh, marketing organizations and sales organizations transform the way that they operate, transform their go-to-market, and work better um, together between sales and marketing. Um, prior to Demandbase, I've been in tech for a long time, and I was excited to come be a part of the MarTech world, which is near and dear to my heart as a marketing leader. So uh, with that, I'm going to introduce my uh, partner in crime, John. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah, great to be here. I'm John Itell. I'm the Chief Sales Officer here at Demandbase. And I've uh, spent the last two decades in you know the sales arena, helping build and scale and, and, and grow teams in you know, kind of high, high, high growth, hyper mode. Uh, and so, you know, we're really excited to be spending time with you all today to talk about a, a topic that's, you know, as old as time, you know, but also one that's near and dear to Kelly and I's heart. And that is using data to align sales and marketing. So without further ado, we'll jump into things here and, uh, you know, kick things off. But, you know, look, we wanted to start with some stats. And this is something that probably everybody's feeling, you know, uh, you know, the stat that we wanted to lead with is seven out of 10 reps site access to stakeholders is a primary challenge today. Um, it's probably one of the toughest times in the world to be selling right now. You know, obviously, you know, things have shifted, changed, you know, from a distribution of, you know, people, population, you know, companies. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's always been the talk of like, is, is, is the phone dead? Uh, is cold, cold calling dying? And now you're hearing, you know, stats around email becoming less and less effective. And so it really has put a ton of burden on sales teams that are trying to get access to buyers. Uh, and it's really hard for them to do it right now. It's not even hard, um, not, even, not only just hard to find those buyers, it's hard to find the buyers that are actually in the market for what you're selling. So if you think about even if you nail exactly who that stakeholder is, exactly what persona they, they embody, what they care about, what their pain points, what market they're in, all their firmographics, technographics, all the things you need to be able to market to them effectively. Only 5% of those are actually in the market to buy your product. That means the other 95% of your time and effort there is being spent on brand building, I guess, for future buying. Uh, but for the time being, it's a lot of kind of wasted um, efforts to try to find the right folks. The challenge is, as a marketing leader is, I mean, certainly for me, different way for you is that we're all being tasked with doing more of this with less resource. As you mentioned, this these days are harder than ever for sellers to be able to find the right folks. For marketers, when we have less dollars, less people, uh, less room for error when we miss, um, it's definitely more difficult than ever. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I actually feel like, you know, the, 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 the mantra of, yeah, do more with less is definitely ringing true. You know, growth at all costs is no longer, uh, you know, what any of us are working within. And so it's all about focused growth, which really puts a lot of dependence on the efficiency. So, yeah, jumping into that, I think actually, you know, stats that we look at, you know, often, but the, these are, you know, kind of sentiment from the, you know, from, from the audience that we talk to here about what's, uh, you know, what is most critical for driving growth. And on the left shows today uh, versus, you know, in the boxes to the right last year, right? And as you can see, improving sales and marketing alignment is on top of everybody's mind. And that needs just growing more and more, uh, you know, with time. S sales and marketing alignment is the number one priority. Uh, and it really puts a lot of pressure on, you know, us as leaders, you know, to be able to figure this out. And it really, you know, begins with, uh, you know, the, 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 the true sales alignment between, you know, sales and marketing here. Well, what's so funny is that those win rates, marketing investment, those are the obvious answers, right? What do we need to drive growth? We need to spend more money. We need to win more deals, of course. And yet those still showed up as less important than sales and marketing alignment, which I think is pretty fascinating. Yeah, yeah, totally. You know, and I think just jumping into it, I think actually, you know, even furthering down this trend, you know, when we surveyed folks, uh, you know, it, it, it shows that 52 percent of teams out there, uh, you know, feel like they are aligned, you know, with their sales and marketing counterparts. Um, and so in some ways, that's great. It means that, uh, you know, half of the teams out there don't have this problem. And so uh, kudos to them. But it means that overwhelming, you know, uh, you know, majority of folks are really in the same boat or feeling the tension. They're feeling the stress. And look, that cascades down to their teams, you know, and again, is felt, you know, throughout the organization as they are, you know, fighting harder and harder to make the dollars they have to, to you know, to at play to work, uh, to get more out of the teams that they're working with. And, and this tension really leads to a lot of bad outcomes that we'll talk about more throughout the presentation here. 
You know, this tells me, this is me off the cuff. This tells me that 52% of companies have CROs who manage sales and marketing. That's the only reason they're not struggling with that alignment, right? Because they are one person managing it all. Anytime there's two humans, like we are working hard to make sure that we're aligned, right? It is a conscious effort that every company in that boat, I think, has to be thinking about every day. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I think actually, it, again, it's been around forever, it's this problem. Uh, you know, I, I think it gets exacerbated at different times. And, you know, you and I can attest to this. It's probably felt more when times are tough, right? Uh, and, and, you know, especially when you distribute a population with a pandemic and everybody goes to virtual, right? Communication gets strained. And so, you know, it definitely has been, you know, something that is that does need kind of refocus, re reigniting and reinvestment. Um, you know, two is going to be better than one, though. I do believe that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the end, you know, having strong leaders that, you know, both on both fronts is the, is the winning playbook here. But it really means that we have to stay in sync. And that's, uh, you know, that's what I love about what we do, uh, you know, together and as a company with demand base. I do think the, uh, you know, great comments I get from our customers is that, you know, our tool adds so much value to go to market teams. Um, but a CMO actually told me that, you know, uh, you know, what we do is so powerful, but, you know, for our success to matter, it re requires two people to get along and they often don't. And so I thought that was pretty funny. And, and my retort and come back to that was, now, look, if you have all these things in place, you know, we can be the enforcing mechanism to really make sure that all teams are kind of rowing in the same direction and being able to drive to the same outcomes. Absolutely. Yeah, it's super critical. I think some of those challenges, there's a few, right? And why um, sales and marketing, you know, often have challenges. I think often we're measuring different metrics. So what success looks like for me as a marketer is often different one than what success looks like for you as a seller. Um, sometimes there's been poor handoffs right? We don't, we may have a strategy and a playbook that we're running and we kind of just throw it over the fence to you instead of, um, instead of, you know, working on it together and, and marketing and selling to customers um, continuously. And so I think those are, those are things and those, those are changing. And we'll, we'll talk about those today about how we're evolving those, but those are definitely two of the challenges. What else we got? Yeah, look, I think these four all resonate with me, but I think, you know, you're absolutely right. Measuring different met metrics to double down on that. Um, you know, oftentimes we can speak different languages, right? We can have different things that we care about. And so, you know, they all need to stack together and work towards a common outcome. But I think that when you don't have those, you know, metrics aligned, you know, you really feel it. I think the other two that really, you know, stood, stood out to me in this graph here, obviously operating with different systems and lack of communication. I do think, you know, marketers live in marketing systems, sales, you know, professionals usually live in sales you know, systems. Oftentimes those systems don't talk. And then, you know, when those teams don't talk, it really even gets worse. Right. So you have complete confusion and disorientation uh, and you lose that strength of uh, feedback loop, too. Right. So you understand that, you know, the things that you're doing, Kelly and your teams are working on are really driving the right outcomes for us. And, you know, look, that we're also able to, to follow through on the things that we say we're going to do and making sure that we're making good on our end of the province. So, you know, again, all these different gaps really you know, allow these, these, you know, tensions to build. Um, and, and like those, like we said, these are the, these are the big ones that we hope to help, you know, others to challenge others address in, the, in their uh, go to market here. Yeah. And just for a housekeeping issue, in case anybody did what I just did and what I did when we first put these slides together was these numbers don't add up to a hundred and that's a circle and that's strange, but it's because people could vote in different areas. And the reality is it's because no one is struggling with one of these issues. They are struggling with multiple of these issues. They are like, yeah, it's different data, but it's because we're using different systems. We have different metrics. We're not talking about it. We're not handing it off between us. We're not sharing those metrics. And so people are kind of in all over the place, which is why these numbers add up to more than 100, because there really are multiple issues that are uh, that are impacting our ability to, to align. Totally. Thanks for clarifying. As you say, 50% <laughs> of the time, it works every time. Uh, <laughs> Uh, is always my funny running joke on that, but yeah, <laughs> explains the discrepancy there. But obviously, you know, these are the big four that we, you know, we hear often uh, from the respondents we survey here. Absolutely. So let's talk about what it looks like when sales and marketing aren't aligned. We've all felt it, but I think, you know, the butting heads and, you know, due to the conflicting, you know, priorities, the teams feel at odds with each other. You know, it's the us versus them. Uh, you know, language, it's people talking about, you know, they're doing, doing it to me again, not with me, um, you know, and that really, you know, can rear its ugly head and really cause, you know, engagement of teams to suffer. Um, you know, the teams feel it when they're always in tension, the customers feel it, right. It's not an ideal experience for anybody involved here. You know, the different incentives, right. You know, I think when, 
you know, one team feels successful and the other one's losing, like that's a really, really bad day and a bad outcome, uh, but can often happen when, when these things aren't balanced or put in check. And then disunified efforts for uh, separate goals here. You know, I think that's the, you know, the big one too, where you see, you know, one team saying we're successful, you know, we did our end of the, the bargain, like what gives you guys aren't as good as uh, you said you were, you're not holding up your end. And, and all these things compound again in lots of uh, unique ways and they rear their head in ugly ways too, right? And it really, you know, doesn't build for a healthy functioning team, um, which ultimately costs the business you know, over time here. Yeah, I mean, we've all sat in those pipeline review meetings where we look and we're like, well, it looks like we're doing great on on opportunities. Good job, marketing. Um, sales would be great if you could close some. And instead of saying, hey, guess what? We're all missing our revenue number. We're all missing our pipeline number. And John and I have talked about it since, since before I started here about how do we make sure that we are in lockstep prior to uh, making sure that our teams are, that we're all driving towards the same goal. It doesn't do anybody good anybody any good if I hit so-called marketing metrics um, and the company doesn't hit its revenue metrics. Um, there's no there's no win in that. So we might as well all be playing the same game. All of our incentives are aligned. All of our uh, goals are the same. That means we win together, we lose together, right? Absolutely. Which takes us to... Yeah, so absolutely. Like I said, you're doubling down on that. You know, our jobs depend on this alignment. You know, it really... Uh, you know, can 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 drive towards the company's success. It can ultimately drive to you and I's success. And so, you know, we want to make sure our teams, you know, feel like they're in alignment. They're pulling together. They know that the work that they're doing, you know, benefits a common goal and good here. And so that's why we need to do it. And if we don't, you know, then our jobs become in jeopardy and we don't want that. Yeah. And, it's, and where does it start? I mean, as you just said, it starts with us, right? It starts with me and you making sure that we're in lockstep making sure that my team, my leadership team, your leadership team are in lockstep, making sure that we're, that we're aligning on our goals together, making sure we're aligning on, on where we're going and what those priorities are. Then the technology, the process, and the people fall together. But when, when, the, when we're not aligned at the top, then nothing ever, uh, ever works out. Um, I have these conversations with CMOs sometimes, and they'll say, um, they'll say, am I ready for an ABM solution? Is this the right time for me to put in a piece of technology? I'd say, well, you should probably figure out, make sure the strategy is in place first. Make sure you have people that can manage. Make sure you have a process that you can do handoffs and uh, and clean transition um, and a continuous flow of, of, of leads or um, intent from marketing to sales. You get all that, then you can throw technology on it. But get all that stuff worked out first, and then and then the technology can help facilitate that. But don't do it in reverse. And I think that's that's the same idea of how do we... Um, how do we implement that alignment? That technology is really that last step. Yeah, yeah, totally. It does start with the people. It starts with the, you know, the, the tone at the top that, that we set. I think it has to be, you know, broken through kind of like nuance and subtleties. But I think, you know, you and I talk about this, you know, often, but, you know, if I miss, you miss, right? And, and then vice versa. And I think we have to have that same kind of belief and mindset, right? That's, you know, not one of us can win without the other. You know, I think also, you know, there's lots of ways to facilitate the communication that you need to make this work, the structure and the, you know, the, the amount of rigor here. But it can't be marketing's meeting that sales attend, attends here. And it can't be sales meeting that, you know, sales is meeting that marketing attends. It needs to be, you know, truly a go to market meeting that, you know, Kelly and I are hosting. We're driving the priorities. We're holding people accountable and ultimately building trust together as a team, too. I think that's, you know, uh, when, when I talk about this, when I've seen it at its worst, you know, I've been in these, these, you know, pipeline review, funnel review meetings, you know, where, you know, it's, it's basically, you know, like two scorpions in a bowl, one waiting for the other to strike, uh, you know, and, and everybody's kind of presenting data with a defensive posture, you know, actually trying to, to show data in a light that actually doesn't make them look bad or not show data, you know, that doesn't reflect something that would be, you know, a, a, you know, potentially a bad look for them. Uh, and that's what a really unhealthy look, look is, you know, here. And so I think if we get this right, you know, obviously, you know, you and I through, you know, kind of our joint leadership in these types of initiatives can share like accountability has got to be there. But, you know, ultimately we we should have each other's back. And, and again, in that, that unhealthy situation, you know, when myself and the CMO made this posture change and really reset with the team, you know, there was a, there were some really great breakthrough moments where, um, you know, someone actually kind of owned up to, to not being able to deliver on an expectation that was set. You know, I think at the time marketing said we you know, overshot on these goals for this event. It didn't actually you know, pan out the way we expected. Um, and instead of the other team ready to pounce on it and say, okay, that's exactly why we can't be successful because of that moment. 
um, it became more of a unifying moment where, you know, sales is like, no, I've got it. I appreciate it. Like, let's make sure we fix that, you know, or make sure we, 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 we assess these things better. But guess what? We have some goodness on the other side of the equation. We're seeing some, you know, really great things come out of this install base, you know, campaign that we were running. And so uh, we're going to be able to meet and exceed our objectives there so we can cover each other here uh, and, and hold each other true through this. And so I think that was kind of like the, the healthy moment or tipping point that I, I saw in my own you know, career and background. And it was largely driven by myself and the CMO, um, being able to set that right, you know, kind of expectation and, and tone with the team. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think all of us have worked in a company, you know, throughout our careers, potentially as sort of junior marketers and sellers coming up. I have witnessed where my leader was not aligned with the cross-functional leader. And you felt that tension all the way down. If, if the top was divided, it meant that me working across the aisle with my sellers was going to be strange. They were getting different direction from their management than I was. What my priorities were, were not their priorities. And so it made everything underneath it harder um, and more difficult. It made our teams really struggle with how we operated. And so being able to kind of clear those hurdles to where to make sure that my team is driving the exact same priorities that your team is, um, ensures that we're all going the same direction. And then when those handoffs happen, then it's a clean, and we do, then we kind of hold hands on those times when, when we miss that event or, you know, our, our goals fall short on something that we can still make up for it on the other side. All right. So, so what are the keys to alignment? So how do we get there? It's so a few things, and I think they've changed a little bit over time in the how, um, and the what, but I think the, what are the, what they are is is not right. These are consistent through time and time again. Um, first thing is about the marketing to sales handoff, um, and handoff is actually a misnomer and kind of a big fat lie because it really is a continual back and forth. And John will go through that in just a minute. The second one is really about metrics and making sure that we define key metrics and shared metrics is probably more important than what those metrics are. It's more about that they're all aligned around the same ones, and we all know what success looks like. Um, and then finally, it's that transparency and communication, that there should be bi-directional communication between us um, to ensure that we're talking all the time. So let's start with the handoff. The old handoff used to be just that. It used to be, okay, I got the top of the funnel, you got the bottom of the funnel. So I will start with getting some responses, driving some leads, however we want to define those, and I'll get them through to, um, to a BDR or an SDR making the phone call. Once they do that, I'm out and I've hit my goal. I'm going to hand them over to sales and then sales is going to take them through to closed one. So if it breaks before pipe, it's mine. If it breaks after it's his and we'll call it a day and then we can each kind of point fingers and blame each other when it doesn't work. The new one is not that right. The new one says, Hey, we're going to go both directions uh, and it's going to look a little different than that. How does that work, John? Yeah, no, totally. does. I say, I think that's exactly it. And I think the, you know, the pillars of the, you know, what you do haven't changed over time, but how you do it, I think you're right, is completely changed with this new, you know, way that buyers are buying and the way that the buyer's journey has changed, right? And so I think you're absolutely right. The new orchestrated model, you know, really kind of splits the funnel in half and actually, you know, gives us all kind of responsibility, full funnel end to end. And, you know, customers are passed back and forth. It's not a one-time handover, right? It can actually be multiple touch points throughout, uh, which really keeps us in lockstep throughout the customer's journey here. Yeah, and it's ironic that when this concept of ABM first came out, it was called a marketing function, essentially, right? It was account-based marketing. It was, hey, marketers, how are you going to go after certain accounts? And then once we get some traction, hand them over to sales to close. Now it's account-based X experiences, right? It's it's marketing and sales because we're, we're going after the accounts. Sales is going after the accounts. Sales is coming back and saying, hey, I'm starting to get some some a bite here? Can we tee up some ads for them? Can we invite them to a webinar? We're saying, hey, these folks just engaged in a webinar. You should follow up with them. It's this back and forth the whole time of conversation um, because it is. It's it's an, an entire account-based go-to-market strategy um, and process. It's not just marketing or sales. It's everything combined. Totally. And it extends to customer as well. I was going to say, I think you and I can remember when it was ABM and now ABX. And I think the really neat thing is that when I was first introduced to it, it was introduced through my CMO. We made the decision together to to jointly imp implement this solution, but it was largely driven by you know her at the time. You know now you're seeing sales teams come to the table saying, "I want to have this you know intent based, account based you know uh, solution." And then customer success teams are talking about this, like how do we use this type of data 
to manage, you know, both sides of this equation, not just from acquiring the customer, but then once we bring them on board, how do we know, you know, when to talk to them, you know, with the right message, you know, who should we be talking to? So it really drives this great sophistication. And I do love that it's not just marketing only, it's now sales marketing, you know, again, all together pulling as one. Yeah. And I think that was a good point to mention CS, really that retain and expand often bleeds into our, our customer success departments and bring being able to bring them back. And they also want to see the intent. They want to see if their current customers are checking out our other web pages. They want to know if our current customers are looking at competitors. They want to know all that so that we can come back around, remarket them, retarget them, give them more information. I think um, that's that's sort of an extension. I mean, that's why this ABX continues to to go throughout the customer lifecycle. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, I think you know, just kind of following along in this too, I would say, you know, I would say, why why don't we talk about like what it would be like in a world, uh, you know, where sales and marketing cannot be successful individually? You know, we 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 teased and talked about this. Probably everybody who's watching this has seen it or felt it in some way, right? But when we aren't aligned, you know, on these goals and metrics, or we're not aligned, you know, in spirit for the right outcomes here. You know, you can have marketing at the bar high fiving because they hit their events or MQL lead, you know, goals there while, you know, at the end of the quarter, the sales team is you know hanging their head and, and walking out feeling like they uh, they lost. Right. Not not a great place to be for for either the you know, in that scenario. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's hard to imagine um, how sales and marketing could ever be aligned in the old way of having two different sets of metrics. Right. It's why those. Those metrics are so important um, to bring it together. And so that world really does exist because we need to move to a world that has these aligned metrics. So we talk about, um, you know, and John, you can go through some of these. These affect uh, your world a lot. But when we talk about pipe and op and conversion, like these are things we need to be doing together. Yeah, I totally, I don't say like, that's the big cause of the slide and really what we want to bring to light here. Because I think metrics have always existed but we've often set metrics in a silo or in our own kind of frame of reference. And so look, that's where these bad outcomes really spring up. So I think being able to, you know, stack hands with your sales or marketing counterpart uh, to be able to agree on what are the key health metrics we want to, you know, align to, you know, average deal size, CAC payback, conversion rates, pipeline, you know, average sales cycle, you know, keeping it simple is probably always my best, you know, uh, advice in this situation, but, you know, keeping it simple yet aligned, uh, to each of our areas and what we can impact and make sure that they also, you know, add up to each other. You know, Kelly made the the joke about the percentages not adding up on one of our previous <laughs> slides. But look, I've seen that happen too, right? You know, that's another point of like where sales and marketing cannot be aligned, you know, is that marketing set goals that don't, you know, tie off to the to the revenue goals that the sales needs to achieve. So already from the get-go, we were set up to fail, right? You need to make sure um, that everything kind of ties off, not only to, to make sure everybody knows what they're doing when, but also um, and how we can be successful together needs to be part of that formula. Yeah, you know, I, I've worked in an organization before where um, we didn't have aligned metrics and you realize the tension that it caused. So I, in, my, in this particular organization, I had the SDRs reporting into marketing. And so it, I guess entirely what I had kind of control over was from first touch or lead all the way through stage two opportunity, basically to the meeting completion. And then it was a handoff and, and sales kind of took it from there. The challenge was what was happening is we were hitting all of our pipeline goals. And so as a marketing organization, we're like, hey, we're building pipe, not just leads because leads are dead. We're going after pipe. So pipe, we're hitting all these goals, but we noticed that of all the stage two opportunities, we were only converting to closed one 20% of the time. Sales driven uh, stage two ops, partner driven sales two ops were converting at 40, 50%, but we were only converting at 20. And so I'm sitting here thinking, how come sales like hates our, our, our opportunities? They accepted them. They took them at stage two and they said, hey, yeah, we'll take it. Like they had the meeting. They decided that was a good quality thing. They accepted it, but then they didn't do anything with it. And so I'm thinking, why is, you know, my first thought is why doesn't sales do what they're supposed to do? Why aren't they working these opportunities? And so that can first, if you're not aligned on metrics, what that does first is you start pointing fingers. I mean, I did my job. Why can't they do theirs? Right. Like, how is this happening? But instead took a different approach. I sat down with every sales leader and I said, let's go through your pipe. I'm going to specifically your stage two pipe. I want to go line by line through Salesforce on every record. 
um, that you have that's under your name and tell me what's wrong with it. Marketing source. And we start going through it. And what I realized after going through hundreds and hundreds of records that they were all good quality. They were the right persona. They had the right need state. They had the right, um, we could solve their problem. Our technology met their needs. All of those things that use the right technology that fit in our, in our space. So all those things were there. The challenge is that we, they, none of them had a sense of urgency. None of them had a pressing event or something or an imminent timing of that they were planning to make a decision the next three months or six months. And so that timing component meant that none of these folks were ready to move. And so what that told me was, hey, we're giving them good quality. We're giving them good pipe, but we're not qualifying on all the right criteria. You know, you've heard of BANT. We were sort of going to ban and forgetting the T on the end. And so we were getting budget, you know, authority, need state. We were not getting to the timing component. And so just sitting down and saying, hey, let's do this together taught me that, hey, I need to change my qualification criteria. And we did that. And all of a sudden it moved forward our stage two. They started converting at a much higher rate. Now we took a pipeline drop because less things made it through because less companies were in an urgent state. But but that was okay because what was coming out the other end was much higher quality, converted at a much higher rate, got to close one faster, took less resources of just sitting in Salesforce not moving. And so, but that was that took us saying, hey, marketing and sales, let's work together and figure out the problem instead of, hey, marketing, I did my job. I wish sales would do theirs. So bringing that together, and that comes from the fact that we all had a stake in closed one revenue. We all had a stake in conversion rate, not just pipe creation, but pipe creation plus conversion plus revenue and all the things together. So um, I think it's it's super important. I've seen the literally the trade-offs of not working, working together versus working together, and it's night and day. Yeah. I mean, it's such a cool story. And you're right. You had the right buyer, probably the right message, but not the right time. And so, you know, if your sales counterpart isn't giving you that feedback, right, we're just going to continue to to push more volume through and then be, you know, in tension with each other because one's not, you know, potentially doing what they th they should be doing. And then the finger pointing begins. Right. And so yeah. it's so powerful to have those loops. I do think also like the loops, you know, are so important. And I think the alignment's so important. And I think, look, I would say, don't be afraid to let go of, you know, metrics that don't matter or need to be reset, right? You mentioned like pipeline had to drop, right? But it was like, okay, but it was artificially inflated pipeline maybe because of that, uh, you know, because it was an active pipeline that could be used. So I think that, you know, I see that oftentimes when the teams get intention and they get so stuck on, you know, what, what they set in place and have such pride of ownership and decisions they may have made, you know, last year, um, it just continues to leave the team in tension and furthers this divide and doesn't, you know, isn't a healthy thing. And so I think being able to like come to the table as partners, see these things more clearly and then reset when it's time, I think is such a powerful thing. And, and the teams will see it. They'll, you know, respond and react to that and, and understand like this is how we how, how we drive to positive outcomes together and not continue just doing things for the for the sake of activity or for metrics that have moved on. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 exactly right. I almost think it maybe should be quality pipeline or instead of total pipe, I guess, is the better word. I guess it's where conversion rates uh, pulls that quality through. But I think you're right. And I think sellers, um, you know, for all their we're trying to do the right thing in our situation. They were trying to reward the SDRs for bringing them a good quality deal. They're like, hey, the guy did a lot of work to bring it to me. I want to give him, you know, throw him a bone by accepting the deal. I just know it's not going anywhere for a while. You're like, okay, well, that's probably not great either, but I love that they were trying. So by those, you know, it just, it, it spirals. We want everybody to be aligned. We want everybody to drive together. Um, but it just takes getting into the weeds sometimes to figure out where we're missing. Yeah. I've heard you say it before, but assuming good intent uh, is always helpful in these types of situations when navigating conflict, yeah. but being able to yeah get down to the tactical level at times and understand like, why are things not working and then make those adjustments when they need to be made. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great, that assuming good intent, if you all have the same metric, if everybody's driving to, towards revenue and highest conversion possible, then you have to assume everybody's doing whatever they can to support that. And then you, you know, adjust if you miss, you work together, you win together, lose together. All right. Um, the last one I think of those kind of three elements of, of driving um, alignment is really about transparent communication. This is just a quick little quote, but the reality is like, when we are picking our target account list, when we are identifying the types of accounts, the types of personas, the types of customers we want to go after, we should do it together. That's what this one's talking about specifically. But the reality is 
if we're going to run sales plays on a certain product or at a certain audience or with a certain buyout or with a certain whatever, we should be in lockstep on that. What's How is that going to play out in your team? What is that going to look like from a go-to-market strategy? What is that going to look like from a budget perspective? And we need to work on it. And if it's not working, sales needs to be comfortable enough to kind of come back and say, hey, we tried that. Can we tweak this? This isn't working. This message is off. This isn't resonating. I made this adjustment. Now it's working. Let's feed that back into the master. So being able to have that sort of not just transparent communication, but bi-directional communication um, is really key. It's super critical. And I think we talked a lot about it throughout this presentation, but I think this quote really brings it home there. It has to be you know, both ways. I do think if it isn't, uh, you, you get that distrust that builds with the team where it's like, you know, marketing, you know, pick the leads or, you know, sales is, you know, not following through on this. It just, you know, again, continues to compound and compound. And so I always like to really drive home to like, let's do it, you know, do it with each other, not to each other here. And so I think if you have that like joint partnership where we're picking these accounts together, we have like an ownership model that we've you know, well articulated and understood. And then we're not afraid to be, you know, uh, candid with each other and, and hold each other accountable. Still, still needs to be a big part of the process. Um, yeah, that's how you avoid these situations. Yeah, absolutely. And if we do it all right, what happens? Yeah. So look, I think this is hopefully was, was helpful for others. And, you know, uh, it definitely was helpful for me as we talk through this, you know, in, in, in our own you know world and, you know, as Kelly and I being newer to our roles, you know, kind of set the right foundation for our teams to work together. But, you know, when sales and marketing are aligned, good things happen. And that's what we really want everybody to be able to feel the, the impact of you have higher conversion rates, you have, you know, faster closes and more qualified leads. And ultimately, you know, we uh, we win together, like Kelly said multiple times here. Awesome. Well, I am so excited that I get to be in the trenches with you every single day, John, because um, I'm having a blast. So this was uh, this couldn't be more fun. Yep. The feelings mutual. And likewise. Uh, yeah. And, and this has been a great, great talk today. So thanks, everybody.